Announcements uh, in your bulletin that I, I need to bring up and one that isn't. Um, first, there is no Bible study Tuesday or Wednesday for the next two weeks because uh, the guy that does our Zoom hosting is not going to be there. Uh, and the guy that records the Wednesdays and puts them up on YouTube is not going to be there. So, uh, two weeks off from the Bible studies. The uh, Veterans Appreciation Meal at the Briggs Center in Wapolo. That's a few weeks away, but they, uh, it looks like they're trying to get a count. Uh, a thank you for the folks that are going to cover for Bob Tech while he is gone. And please get back to Bob if you haven't already uh, to dis for a called session meeting if you're available, either after church on the 16th or late afternoon, October 18th. Um, and related to it, but separate, I am asking for all of the session members uh, to come up after the service for an uh, informational thing. Uh, so if you would please meet here immediately after the service, then uh, we can discuss some of the issue that is related to that and my thoughts on it. And then we can have the called meeting of discussing the actual upgrade to the sound system at another time. Are there any other announcements to make at this time? Bob. Just a minor one, but I'm going to once again sound like a broken record. Uh, Friday evening, Pastor John called me because he was having a little brain fade. He said, I want the church. I don't know. Would you check it for me? So I did. I came over here and checked it. Everything was fine. All locked up. I came back again last night to do the bulletin. It was about 5.30. Mission door was open. I have no idea who, but... Up. Got to make sure that door is shut. Even if you've done the lock thing on the knob, it fits a lot tighter. So you have to make certain it is shut. By the way, the tighter fit is good because that means the weather doesn't get in and cause electrical bills to rise. Are there any other announcements to make at this? Your shirt. Oh, <laughs> I was looking. <laughs> thank you. It's a new one, so thank you. Okay, I feel done now. <laughs> Are there any other announcements to make at this time? <laughs> then let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the prelude. Played, uh, Where to Cross the Crowded Ways of Life.
Good morning. Would you all join me in the call to worship? God has set before us life and death. We long to choose life. God has set before us blessing and cursings. We long to choose blessings. So we gather this morning around the table, Christ's table. We gather to drink the cup of blessing, to eat the bread of life. Let us share the meal together. Let us feast on the word. Let, Let us worship God with joy. Now will you, will you join me in the welcoming hymn 239, For the Beauty of the Earth. Join me in the responsive reading in the Living Bible, number 84. I love the Lord because he hears my prayers and answers them. Because he bends down and listens, I will pray as long as I breathe. Death stared me in the face. I was frightened and sad. Then I cried, Lord, save me. How kind he is, how good he is. So merciful, this God of ours. The Lord protects the simple and the childlike. I was facing death, and then he saved me. Now I can relax, for the Lord has done this wonderful miracle for me. 
He has saved me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I shall live, yes, in his presence here on earth. In my discouragement, I thought they are lying when they say I will recover. But now, what can I offer Jehovah for all he has done for me? I will bring him an offering of wine and praise his name for saving me. I will publicly bring him the sacrifice I vowed I would. His loved ones are very precious to him, and he does not lightly let them die. O Lord, you have freed me from my bonds, and I will serve you forever. I will worship you and offer you a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Here in the courts of the temple in Jerusalem, before all the people, I will pray everything I vowed to the Lord. Praise the Lord. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Therefore, relying on the love and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, we courageously confess our sins together. Join me in the prayer of confession. Merciful and forgiving God, we need a spirit of love and acceptance to flood into our lives this day. Even though we celebrate the World Communion Sunday with the giving of the precious bread and the beloved cup, still our anger and vengeance against others. We act out of frustration rather than love. We hoard your gifts and only grudge share our bounty with others. We find ways to turn our backs on you, claiming that other things are more important than our faith. And in the midst of struggle and strife, we come back to you, awash in tears and sorrow. We plead for your help and salvation. Remind us again, O oh Lord, that your love has always and will always be with us. You have called us to be witnesses to good things that can help when we follow your ways. You have asked us to reach out across our borders, our oceans, our fears to others with the reconciling love of your Son, Jesus Christ. Heal us from your selfishness and our apathy. Give us courage and strength for the ministries in which you have placed us. For we ask these things in Jesus Christ. Amen. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but it is, has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We have died to sin in him, so let us live as people freed by grace our faith for our faith.
Will you join me in the prayer for illumination? Holy God, as we hear your word read and proclaimed, guide us to such sound teaching you have for us. With the help of the Holy Spirit, entrust us your good treasure, and through it make us alive in faith. Amen. Our readings today are Romans 1, 18 through 23, and Psalm 19, 1 through 4. Many people claim not to see any evidence of the existence of God, yet Paul asserts that everyone at some level has some awareness of God, but that many choose to suppress this knowledge rather than submit their lives to him. Romans. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may we be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Psalm 19, 1 through 4. Since the earliest times, people have looked up at the sky and recognized some divine power at work. The wordless testimony of the heavens does not tell us much about God's characters, so that some people have imagined gods of the sun and the moon and the thunder and the lightning. But the power and splendor of it all convinced people that a power far greater than their own was at work. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Days after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue our sermon series uh, on Romans today, moving into a new section, if you will, of Paul's letter. He's given his greeting, he's stated his theme, and now he's moving into a logical progression to help people realize 
what is going on. And it shows, I think, how Scripture and the good news of the Gospel, belief in Christ, is something that is not blind faith, but something that has a logic to it, has a uh, sense of order to it, has very obvious reasons, uh, causes, and effects within it. Um, and therefore, as Josh McDowell liked to say, you don't have to check your brain at the door to come into church. But what he speaks of here is something that is very difficult for modern sensibilities. It's very offensive. Uh, the wrath of God. Particularly in churches that emphasize grace to the exclusion of truth, and those people who strongly believe in humanism, and it's coincidental belief that human nature and society evolve and can one day develop a utopia where everyone will be morally responsible because society itself will provide the framework to bring heaven to everyone with no need for judgment or hell. That's the kind of thinking that goes on today. And the fact of the matter is that when you look at studies, and I know I've mentioned this in Bible study, and I'm sure I've mentioned it at point, some point in my uh, sermons over the years, but there was a recent Pew study, actually it was done in 2020, and in it, 42% of Christians who identified themselves as evangelical, which has a very straightforward definition, said they don't believe in hell. Those that call themselves Christian and aren't necessarily evangelical, if you add that in to them, 62% don't believe in hell in this particular study. Now, that's a scary thing to me because the whole reason why we need communion, the whole reason why we need salvation, as we'll see, is to come out from under the wrath of God. Because God is our judge. But then again, modern people, they, they don't like to talk about judgment either. Okay? Uh, everything's supposed to be acceptance. In this passage, the wrath of God, I want to note, is parallel to the righteousness of God. They even have the same pattern or language that... The righteousness of God is revealed. The wrath of God is revealed or being revealed. When we do have our Bible study in a couple of weeks, I'll be covering it in much greater depth. But for now, let me just say that there are multiple types of wrath for God described in the Bible. And Paul is talking about one in particular here. And I would also note that wrath in every definition is not rage. It is not God just lashing out. And even when he has vengeance, it's not for his own sake, but for others. And so, it's important for us to understand that when we talk about the wrath of God, frankly, a lot of times it's not even connected with the anger of God. Rather, it speaks of the judgment to come. This wrath is not directed against goodness, but against, quote, all, of the, all the godlessness and wickedness of men, unquote. It's not raging anger. It's a consequence given in love. Yes, God loves even those who defy Him and deny Him. God doesn't lie. 
And throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, you see the Word of God listing both what is offensive to Father God and what will happen ultimately if we continue to offend God and deny Him and His Word. And this is what this section is primarily about. Paul takes the wrath of God as a given and then wants to explain to them why it's there. And since he's talking particularly to Gentiles who don't have the history and the knowledge and the learning about the Scriptures, he goes to what they would understand, which is creation itself nature itself. At another time in Acts 17, he talks about how creation shows who God is. And in this time, he, when he talks about it, he speaks of the truth of God, which is that of judgment. And he says, they suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now, in order to suppress a truth, that means you have to realize that it's a truth. You actually have to realize that there is a God before you go denying Him. You have to realize that God has a rule and a role before you try to take it away. So they suppress the truth. And he notes that this truth may be known about God. It's plain, because God has made it plain to them. And somebody might say, oh yeah, where? And he says, for the creation of the world, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, that is, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Creation itself, as the psalm notes noted, testifies to the glory of God. There is order throughout creation. There is physical order. There is moral order. There is every sign that there is a creator. Now, I could go on for half hour by itself about the illustrations of God's existence and creation due to order, but I'm not going to. We have a busy day today anyways with communion and whatnot. Uh, though I can promise or warn those that come to Bible study that they will get to hear some of it. But let me just say one of my favorite illustrations that I'm sure I've used before, but it's a good one. And that is, there is a science out there called chaos theory. And chaos theory is a mathematical thing where you get to a point using certain kinds of equations where you can't determine where the next point is going to be on the graph. It's totally impossible. But there's two things about it that they've noted. Number one is there seems to be a pattern overall, a boundary. One of my favorite ones is where they do a particular chaotic uh, equation and it makes the, a fern leaf pattern. And it doesn't matter what value you start with. As long as you use that equation and feed whatever the answer is back into the cycle and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, you end up with fern leaves. A pattern of fern leaves. There is also a time in chaotic equations where it goes from chaos to all of a sudden order. It's starting over. And those look a lot like, frankly, our circulatory system, for instance. Bifurcating multiple times until finally it's just a scatter of, of dots and then, boom, a single line. And then that splits, and then that splits, and then that splits. So it does through this cycle. There's order even in chaos. Physically. Astrophysics 
Hugh Ross, I won't mention it here, but uh, he has a couple of different things that he says in terms of cosmology and uh, that point out that we could not be alive. We could not be here if it wasn't for interactions on an atomic level that are critical all the way to 56 places to the right of the decimal point. I don't even know how many zeros that is. Okay? But if you take it the wrong one way or the other, then carbon-based life forms can't come into existence. It's not just physical, though. Morally, there is an order. Conscience. Every culture, even those considered aboriginal or ancient, in every culture there are norms or rules that are described that are very similar to one another. Yes, there are sometimes localized differences on things. But it seems that the conscience of man expressed in society is mostly consistent across all cultures. Now this speaks to a higher standard established by someone or something. Now we recognize that God who created all of us and made us in his image has left his imprint of what it means to be righteous and thus also how we fall short and need a savior. This is what people don't like to hear. Though the evidence from conscience, creation, and God's word is irrefutable, men choose to resist and oppose God's truth by holding fast to their sin. God doesn't exist. God doesn't, or God doesn't, may exist, but he doesn't interact with us today. Or there is no judgment because God is a God of love. However you want to deny it, you are suppressing the truth. Most of them these days go for there is no God, period. And even for those then that may give a qualified definition of God, they neither glorify Him as God nor give thanks to Him, but rather they pervert the truth and create idols, idolatry. This is what's most important, whatever it might be. And sometimes they don't admit it to themselves either, but it is. You know, Jesus himself said, for wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If what you think about most of all is money, and I'm not talking about hoarding money, but even people that are constantly concerned with, do I have enough money? Is there, you know, enough to, to go around? Is and who are concerned with what people will think if they don't have certain, I don't know, brands, certain vehicles, certain pieces of entertainment equipment in their house. Then that's their idol. I don't care if they come to church every Sunday or not. That's still their idol. That's the easy one to do. There are others. There are seven sins, that the seven deadly sins, of course, that Paul mentions. And those include a lot more. They include greed, but they also include lust and rage, gluttony, One of the problems with overeaters is as soon as you finished your meal, you're, you, it goes out the window and you're thinking about your next one. Well, that was good. I wonder what, 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 what I should have for dessert. Or if you've had dessert, I wonder what I should have, what's going to happen tomorrow. That's not that you don't plan ahead. I mean, you know, you want to plan ahead. But if that's the way your thinking goes then food or eating has become your idol. <coughs> uh, 
Idolatry is the perversion of truth. So we deny the truth in order to suppress it, and we find other things to worship in order to pervert it. And Paul says, this is what you were doing. You've made images. Now in those days, I mean, they really made images. Statues. Things like shapes that were of men and women. Or he says birds and animals and reptiles. Remember Egypt and the golden calf during the Exodus? And the calf was, the, actually was a bull, sorry, golden bull. It was supposed to represent strength. God's power, God's strength. They were actually trying to worship God in a way, but they set up an idol. And it got Moses so angry that he smashed the commandments, and then he had to go back up to the mountainside to get another set. <laughs> we pervert the truth because we try to box in God. We say, well, we're going to worship these parts of God, but we can leave out those parts. We're going to study this part of the Word, but we're going to leave out those parts because they make us uncomfortable. We're going to look at creation and we can even appreciate its beauty, but we're not going to worry about how it was made because it's easier just to say, well, it doesn't matter if it was random chance. Those things bring the wrath of God. Because not only are you offending God directly with those, but it opens yourself up to sin. And most of the time, if you idolize something, it's a sin. If you refuse to accept the creation, or creator God, then it's because you want to deny control of the universe to Him and keep it to yourself. And that's a sin. It's called pride. And there are consequences. Separation from God, even here on earth. And eternal separation after death. And I know that that doesn't sound too bad right now, but we'll understand just how incredibly awful it is when we get there. Frankly, the closest I can come to it is, uh, you know, if you've got somebody who's a toddler, you can send them into a screaming fit by walking out the door and going hiding in another room. And they'll come to the hallway and they can't see you. And they think you're gone forever. And they have what's called separation anxiety. Sometimes it extends into older ages and, and other situations. I think that's partly why we play peekaboo. To teach them that just because something's gone doesn't mean it's not coming back. But that kind of terror, that kind of anguish is what's going to happen when we realize that we're separated from God forever. Now that is kind of a depressing thing to hear, I know, but the thing of it is, we have good news to add to it. Because God also loves us. And so God sent Jesus, who came and lived and suffered and died, to cleanse us of our sins, to reconcile us with God, and was raised again that we might have new life in Him, that we might be new creatures, that we might be adopted as God's children, which is a very important thing that Paul talks about multiple times in this letter. A personal relationship a familial relationship with God. And through that, simple faith in Christ and the salvation that came through Him, we can gain all those things. That's why we have communion. Frankly, 
In the Reformed Church, the Presbyterian Church, we call it a sign and seal of God's grace. That's a fancy way of saying that it points us to and reminds us of God's grace. And it's a seal-like imprint that they used to put on letters and things like that. Showing that this is real and true and from whoever it was that the imprint belongs to. Sign and seal that God has extended His grace to us. And because of that, we can celebrate. Because what we can't do for ourselves, God did for us. You just need to believe. Then you need to follow through. And the following through is not as easy, I must admit. It's not a free gift. It takes work. But the hard part really is done. Because we've been reconciled with the Father. We don't need to fear death. We have an eternal future. We know what's going to happen in the end, the victory. And so we can have joy. We can put our trust in God rather than in idols. We can love God and see God everywhere in His creation and in His people rather than denying His existence. And we can trust God to be in control, giving us peace, shalom, that we can know, can't know otherwise. When Christ instituted communion, he instituted a marvelous thing. Of course, you know, he was God, so it's probably, he knew what he was doing. We're going to have communion in a couple of minutes. We've got a few things to do first, like sing a hymn. But I want you to think about that. There is no excuse for not recognizing God. There is no excuse for not recognizing your need. But there's also no excuse for, ce for not celebrating. If you believe. No excuse. Like Nike likes to say, just do it. And celebrate God's presence in your heart your mind, your soul, and your life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you would turn with me to number 245, let the whole creation cry. Let the whole creation cry, Alleluia. Glory to the Lord on high, Alleluia. Heaven and earth awake and sing, Alleluia. God is God and therefore King. Alleluia. Praise Him, all ye hosts above. Alleluia. Ever bright and fair in love. Alleluia. Heaven and earth away and sing Alleluia Night and stars in God rejoice Alleluia Warriors fighting for the Lord Alleluia Earth burning with His word Alleluia, those to whom 
my arts belong. Alleluia. Add their voices to the song. Alleluia. Men and women, young and old. Alleluia. Raise the anthem manifold. Alleluia. And let children's happy hearts. Alleluia. In this worship bear their parts. Alleluia. If you would turn to your communion insert. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty. Creator of heaven and earth, you have made from one every nation and people to live on all the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ by the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit he commissioned us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations and today his family in all the world is joining at his holy table on the night which Jesus was betrayed. He took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the like manner, after the supper, he took the cup and he poured it, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of this, do this remembering me. For as often as you eat the bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim the saving death of your risen Lord until he comes. In remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. As we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with your church throughout the world and strengthen it in every nation and among every people to witness faithfully in your name. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father God, now and forever. Amen. 
the elders would come forward. Come and partake of the feast. Salvation. Together, let us keep the feast. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Beloved of Christ, the cup of salvation. Having received the elements, in God's grace, let us te together say the prayer which Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And it's not temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you would join me in the prayer after communion. We give thanks, loving God, that you have refreshed us at your table. Strengthen our faith. Increase our love for one another. And as we have been fed by the seed that became grain and then became bread, may we go out into the world to plant seeds of justice, transformation, and hope. Amen.
God has given us such great gifts. It's only fitting that we take time to appreciate that, give thanks, and then to consider ways that we can give back to our Creator and our God. some prayer of dedication. Jesus Christ, our Savior, you grant us a power, a spirit of power and love and of self-discipline. Make our power serve you. Make our love show you. Make our acts of giving and self-discipline serve you. Author and inspirer of all generosity. Amen. Please be seated. Another one of the ways in which we admit and show our relationship with God and with each other as the family of God, the people of God, is as we pray for and with each other. There are names listed in your bulletin. They all have their own situations. Some long-term, some not. Pray for them and pray for those situations that are listed. Know that God will answer your prayers. Let's come before God in prayer. God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for you are an awesome God and an awesome Father. Even as we struggle sometimes with what's going on in our lives, what's going on in the lives of friends and family and people in the community, tragedies that we see, we know that you are there. You are there with us. You are there with them. And perhaps through us, they can see you. Lord, continue to strengthen us in our faith, in our understanding, so that we might be faithful witnesses. For those that are sick and are hurt, whether it be spiritual, physical, or mental, make them whole to serve your purposes and to do your will. And Lord, may we never forget, even in the time of loss of loved one, the promise that you have made and have fulfilled in Christ. So that while we grieve the death of someone, we can celebrate the new life they have in heaven. 
we could celebrate the life that they lived here and the witness and impact they made and we can celebrate the bond that we have through you knowing that we shall see loved ones again and we shall celebrate with them and with you Jesus make that a reality soon come back fulfill our hearts that no one can deny you but all will know you are Lord and help us here in this church to be faithful witnesses reaching out to people with the good news of the gospel salvation from your wrath and the chance to know joy even here Lord may all that we do and all that we say be to your praise and your glory for we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Amen if you would stand as you're able and join me for number 27 let's do the first and last verse of how great thou art session to come forward at the end of the service here and Terry Johnson I'd like it if you came too. now may you go forth in the peace of Christ the love of God and share that good news of the gospel and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the Father and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever amen God.